The torus electron model, this is what an electron actually looks like. It's just a resonance field. Many brilliant work, much brilliant work has been done by many, many brilliant researchers and scientists. Uh, electromagnetic models and formulas have been thrown together that actually, that are consistent with the toroidal shape of, a, of, a, of an electron. An electron is simply a coherent resonance in a toroidal field. That's all it is. It's not a particle, it is a resonance toroidal field, a resonating toroidal field, the same with the atomic structure. The, atom, the atom is a toroidal field. It's not the atomic structure that we've been shown by science throughout our schooling careers. This is probably a lot closer to what an atom looks like. Here's a picture of a, a molecular torus of the carbon monoxide molecule. And uh, you start seeing how the toroidal shapes appear everywhere. Here's a toroidal, um, the system, the, the solar system as a torus. And uh, you've, obviously, many of you would have seen the, the fact that our galaxy has shown us to be as a, as a toroidal field. And so it goes. So we, I guess this is probably one of the best descriptions of the nature of our reality and around us. The fractal, multidimensional, toroidal nature of reality. That's a mouthful. But, uh, but this is a beautiful uh, image drawn by Alex Gray, who is just a spectacular artist that has done incredible uh, work. And this just blows. When I see this, this is, this is what I imagine we look at when we look up at the stars and the cosmos. This is a lot closer to the nature of reality that surrounds us than pretty much anything we get shown by NASA. This is all to do with toroidal fields and magneticism. Now, everything is sound and magneticism, and this is really important. How are you guys holding out? Are you okay? Uh, you're the guinea pigs. This is the first presentation that I'm doing. I realize I'm gonna have to, <laughs> I'm gonna have to cut this a lot shorter, but <laughs> I'm testing this on you tonight. Uh, <laughs> and I'm trying, to f I'm trying to see where, which parts I'm gonna have to take out to cut this down, but um, so just hang in here, okay? <laughs> so, <clears throat> what most people don't know is, remember, sound, God said, let there be light. So it's sound, moving sound, sound manifests as toroidal fields, those to moving toroidal fields create magnetic fields, which are toroidal fields as well, and moving magnetic fields create electricity. That's the sequence of events. But what you, this tells us that because sound creates magnetic fields, it means everything must have a magnetic field. It must be magnetic in some sort and in some sort of way and if it's not there's a very specific reason why it's not magnetic so here's an example this blew my mind when I found this little thing from Los Angeles from UCLA I think it's, this is such an important little video that will change your perception of what our universe or what our reality around us is and what how important a role magneticism plays in everything that surrounds us You might not think of water as being magnetic, but it is, and so are graphite, aluminum, and glass. This is a new and different category of magnetism called either para or diamagnetism, and it's different from the magnetism that you're used to. You're probably already familiar with ferromagnetism. Ferro means iron. An unmagnetized piece of iron or nickel or cobalt becomes a magnet in the presence of a magnetic field. The effect is strong and lasts even after the magnet is removed. Paramagnetism is a similar effect, except that it's much weaker and temporary. Aluminum is a good example of a paramagnet. And so is oxygen, which is attracted to magnets. Here, I have a few milliliters of liquid oxygen, which sticks to the magnet. I'll explain why later. Gadolinium oxide and cupric sulfate are good examples of paramagnetic substances. Cupric sulfate is a salt that can be picked up by a magnet. 
Diamagnetic materials are exactly the opposite of paramagnetic. They are always repulsed. They would rather die than be in a magnetic field. An important example of a diamagnetic material is graphite. This specially made pyrolytic graphite is repelled by a magnetic field. Don't be confused. This is not static electricity or eddy currents. Graphite is repelled by a magnet, always, both by the north and south end. Pyrolytic graphite is a grown crystal of flat carbon layers which maximizes the diamagnetic effect. Of course, the best diamagnets are superconductors, which at low temperatures provide exact opposite repulsion to whatever magnetic field is present when they're chilled. They are perfect diamagnets. So it gives you an idea how the nature of reality around us is just, we just don't get taught this stuff, you know, we don't think about it in that sense. And how sound is actually the cause of all the stuff that we're witnessing here. And, sorry, let me go back here. You, you might have seen this, this thing before. So this sort of quantum locking is actually just a magnetic effect. You just saw it as a video. So what have we, we got here? So we have quantum locking. The, the superconductor is locked in space and it stays wherever I put it. You see, this is quantum trapping. Amazing. As, as long as it's so the cold, supercondu it's superconducting it's can frozen with liquid nitrogen it upside down right and it stays locked so the fact that it's it's superconducting is locking the magnetic field in yeah. three dimensions right yeah exactly and that and pivots. You see, because this is a symmetric it can rotate without breaking without break the locking the right. locking doesn't break right because it so it stays there on the the x and y but not on but the, it pivots on the... Yeah, on the axis yeah. of the magnets. You, you see, if yeah. I can move it yeah. on the side, it will again pivot around the axis of the magnet because it makes sure that uh, the magnetic field inside of it stays the same. Right. It's astonishing. Can you put it on the track for us? Yeah. I just levitate it above the track quite high and I can just rotate it. So it's actually floating above the surface. Yeah, it's not floating, it's locked above the surface. So it could pull, you could tilt it at an angle and it would yeah, fly around. Yeah, like this and it will just go around this like this. Really heading. Because it go and just put it at different height, put them in like this. And lock it at the height. Lock right. it, yeah, different height, different configuration. Right. And I can even lock it at the uh, opposite way. If you could just hold for a minute. High. I'm doing the so same thing, hang I'm locking down. it upside down, and then it is suspended. Fantastic. So magnetic fields do what? They do exactly what sound does. They create toroidal fields. Just if you do this, you immediately see the toroidal fields being created by magnets around them. Little toruses. And this is a full magnetic Field, toroidal field spectrum. It's both positive and negative on both sides. There is no positive and negative in magnetic fields. This is where we've been incorrectly taught. It's actually just one field that, that work in opposite directions. It's centrifugal, centripetal forces that work towards against each other and oppose each other. And the complete toroidal field, like the toroidal magnetic field like this, has a both positive and a negative on both sides. So it both pushes and pulls from both sides. That's a complete magnetic toroid. It's not north on the one and south on the other. That's an incomplete magnetic field. This is very important information, people. And this, this connects us to some of the biggest lies we've been told about our reality and the world that we live in. Because we've been told that the sound of the earth creates a magnetic field. Sorry, it's the sound of the earth that creates a magnetic field and not, not the molten iron core. There is no molten iron core in the center of the world. That's another theory that's been proposed and most people believe it these days. It's a nonsensical idea. It's a sound of the earth that creates the magnetic fields around us. By now you should know that sounds is the cause of everything and especially magnetic fields. The problem with our world is that 
the Earth magnetic model is a half a magnetic model. It's north at the top and south at the bottom. That's not a complete magnetic field. And as far as I'm concerned, it's impossible for an Earth-like object to be in a complete magnetic field like the toroidal shape of our solar system and be an incomplete magnetic field itself. Can you see why I would say that? It doesn't make any sense <laughs> that our Earth is a half a magnetic field, an incomplete magnetic field, floating around in a complete magnetic field called our solar system. It would correct itself and over billions of years become a balanced toroidal magnetic field. How that would affect the shape of the earth, I don't know. I'm going to let you figure that out. But this is what a complete and balanced toroidal magnetic field looks like. And what it does, it has an accretion disk in the middle. There you can see that yellow accretion disk. That's the center of the magnetic field. Whichever way you turn it, it's the same. As above, so below. We start to understand some of these basic fundamentals of creation, all coming from the breath of God, the breath of the Creator, the words that we utter. Everything that we say and create has the same effect, creating these complete, perfect magnetic fields. The Taurus equator plane emits energy and matter at its disk, as a disk at the equator. We accept this in the solar system. All the matter in the solar system is emitted at the equator. All the planets go out in this one disk from the sun that rotate around the sun. And the same in the, in the galaxies. The many, many galaxies that we've been shown, photographs, they're all toroidal shaped galaxies with the matter all spewing out at the galactic equator. We're even told that we are crossing the galactic equator because our solar system does this. And we cross the galactic equator. I no longer believe that, but in any case. But so the half truths and half lies being woven together here. And we need to now figure out which is true and which is no longer, which is a lie that we've been spun. This is some of the most beautiful new work. Um, Viewing, being able to actually see what a magnetic field looks like through the ferro lens. This is a quite a new discovery, only about 10 years old. Now we can actually see what magnetic fields look like. This is when you look at a torus. This is what a torus magnetic field looks like. You can see. See the magnetic fields. Some people would call this the ley lines on the surface of the earth. You can actually see the magnetic fields. So I'm suggesting that people that are reading ley lines are actually picking up the magnetic fields that crisscross the toroidal field of our planet. And the ancients knew this. They put all the ancient sites and all these magnetic lines because their they, they, they ancient structures were actually driven by these magnetic lines and these toroidal field, these magnetic lines. You know what I mean. Uh, when you look at the cone-shaped magnetic field under a ferrocell, look at this. When you take a ferrocell and you put it over a, a speaker, uh, like a speaker magnet, look what it does. These beautiful cone shapes that face the middle, just like, just like what? Just like this guy's wristwatch. Can you start seeing why I'm suggesting that these guys are using technology? It was in their wristwatches, they had the cones, all to do with magneticism and sound. We just never saw it like that until we got the ferro cell given to us. And when you bring a magnet towards a ferro fluid, what does the ferro fluid do? It forms beautiful cones <laughs> and just stick right out the ferro fluid. <laughs> and this stuff just gets better and better. And now you start seeing how sound and magneticism plays a role in nature, in structuring the flowers and the shapes of trees and, and everything around us is driven by sound and the magnetic fields that actually create the shapes around us. Are you guys getting excited? Yes about how this stuff works and what we've been missing. So, this brings me to the ancient tools and artifacts and the Taurus stones and the cone-shaped tools. Now suddenly, you have a very different take on when I get excited about the cone-shaped tools and how, why Ed Leed Skalman, when I was told that he, he, was, um, he was seen levitating the giant rocks with these cone-shaped tools and ice cream cones, I got extremely excited because I understood what it means. And, uh, and I've been picking up these cone-shaped tools everywhere. 
and suddenly you realize that play a, they play a very important role in all of human history. This is, from a, the, the, this is from an iron mine in England. These are cones in Egypt. They were completely ignored until I found them. Uh, cones in Australia. Mayan deity holding two cones, just like Edlitz Kalnan was apparently seen. These cone-shaped hats that are found in some tribes that were used for special ceremonies. Why do wizards have hats? As cones and why do wizards wands why are wizards wands um, cone shaped and this is, gets really exciting dragonflies we you know we think of birds flying and and bees you, know, you you may be aware of the fact that it's actually a scientific impossibility for bees or bumblebees to fly because their wings don't they can't carry that body weight so this has been a mystery so I'm gonna bust that mystery for you because dragonflies just like bees and bumblebees and other insects or bugs like that have actually hollow tubes in their wings. Those are not veins filled with blood. Those are hollow tubes that do what? They resonate. When, they, when the dragonflies uh, buzz their, their wings, they don't flap them, they just bzzz, they vibrate. It sends vibrations through their wings and through those hollow tubes, and at the bottom of those hollow tubes, they got thousands of tiny cones that stick out, that send out these, these these sound waves or sazer beams, we're going to get to that, that create, that create magnetic fields around them. And this is why they can buzz around. Viktor Grubinikov was, became famous in the, I think it was in the 50s, when he studied the bugs, uh, the wings of bugs and bees, and he was fascinated by it. And then he built what, he, what became a very famous levitation platform. And he was seen and flying this thing faster than the speed of sound on one of those right and people think this is crazy and how did he what was it made of it was made of bugs wings so when you tell people oh he built this out of bugs wings people go <laughs> what kind of nonsense is that you're a bunch of idiots and you believe that well show you he understood how these bugs wings worked and how they actually functioned and that's why he could build such a device because he thought out of the box and this is to show you some experiments how these bugs wings actually have levitation capacity just this is mind-blowing today we're going to try to get one of these shells to hover over the other one um, the original of this video um, is what inspired me to do this series Nature is fabulous. <laughs> so there you have an idea how Viktor Grabenikov built his little levitation device out of bugs wings because he figured out how these things work. And then we get to the cone-shaped tools in the Rosicrucian Museum. Somebody emailed me today say, hey, he went and he saw these, tool, these, these cones in the Rosicrucian Museum in San Jose and they're really there. So he was surprised that I wasn't making it up. <laughs> he said, I blew his mind. <laughs> Yeah, and they are written, they, can you see cuneiform texts that actually commemorate the building of the temples in Sumer and one of them specifically refers to the temple of Inanna. So somehow they were used just like Edlitz Kalnan was levitating the giant rocks of Coral Castle. They were using these to levitate those giant stones of the temples of Sumer into place. And here is our friend Edlitz Kalnan, Coral Castle. And he levitated those giant blocks. I think the biggest stone there weighs 30 tons or maybe even more. And I called it the ice cream cone phenomenon because that's what he was described. He was, he was, it was said that he moved them with ice cream cones in his hands. And to an uninitiated person that would sound ridiculous. But now you all know why that is so important. It's a spectacular place. I've never been there but I've seen lots of videos of it and I can't wait to go. Uh, and then we get to our Torah stones, our sacred Torah stones, which are clearly not weights for digging sticks. And they are far more important. They are very, very powerful toroid vortex field generators. They generate huge amounts of energy around them. Just like our galaxy, just like our solar system, just like our bodies, just like our hearts create toroidal fields around our bodies. And these, they seem to suck in the the ambient sound around them and actually amplify that. 
They create scalar vortex, uh, vortex technology. That's really what they are. So please understand this, that at the, at the center of that torus is what, what some call the zero point or the, or the, the, the vacuum as, as, um, as Nassim Haramein calls it. That's where we enter into the, the infinite density of creation. As, and Nassim has shown very, very successfully with his uh, papers that the density of the vacuum, where everything out of that point out of which everything manifests into reality, into this much, much less denser thing that we think is our reality, our body, which is actually empty, just full of a bunch of atoms and whatever it is, just resonating, that the point out of which, out of which everything manifests has infinite density. That's a zero point. So now you can understand why sound travels infinitely, because in an infinite density, sound and resonance travels infinitely fast, but light travels infinitely slowly. So that's a very quick way to figure out why sound and resonance travels instantly, because it goes into the zero point of every, of, every, of every atom in our body. As we think, as we speak, it enters all that inside us, and it enters the zero point and the fabric of all creation, and traverses everything instantly. So this when these tor toroidal shapes work, they suck in the ambient sound and they create, and, and as, it, as, they get, as it hits <laughs> those two points hit each other, they create this, this, this next scalar wave around it, and it comes around and it, it enters it again, but it happens simultaneously. So it's a, this actual field that sits there all the time, just resonating. So it looks something like that. And, um, and this is one of the stones that we put in a bucket of water and the next morning it had these thousands of bubbles that were swirling around, moving into the center of the stone. And then you may have heard the story of Nassim Haramein when I took him the stone and this stone over there, uh, when I flew via Doha to Chicago, by the time I, I got off at Doha and, and, and got onto the plane to go to Chicago, the plane was delayed and eventually I was called off the plane because um, because they said there was a security threat in my bag and there were five guns, five guys with guns around my bag and they made me open my bag. Uh, we were already 20 minutes delayed and by the time I opened my bag, I took the, the tourist stone out and I said, oh God, what am I going to tell them? And I said, oh, it's, it's uh, uh, African arts and crafts, you know, it's just uh, it's a present for my friend. And uh, by the time I got back on the plane, uh, when we sat down, my partner told me that when the captain came out of the cockpit, he said that whatever is in that bag crashed the TSA security system. That's why they delayed the plane for 20 minutes. They wouldn't let us take off until they found the owner of that bag and what was in that bag. What I didn't figure out until like two years afterwards is like they didn't even question what was... I pulled out the stone and you know, sweating profusely because they're five guys with guns and the stone was wrapped in like bubble wrap and backing tape so it was not easy to open it up. And you know, I felt like a drug dealer because it looked like you know, <laughs> movies or the drugs backed in. And eventually the stone popped out and it's like, okay, cool, put it back. They never, they never asked me to check the rest of my bag. They, they, it's, they knew what they were looking for. I've only figured this out a lot later, you know, because you... You process, reprocess this, and you go, oh my God, they knew exactly what they were looking for, and, and they just let it go. But, um, so we basically have TSA security, Homeland Security USA, to thank for, to proving us, giving us scientific proof that these are advanced ancient technologies. It apparently shut down the entire office. It put, blew down, you know, shut down all their computers. Everything was shut down because of some sort of weird electromagnetic pulse that was given off by that, by that stone. And I have a present for you because I brought that stone with me. This is it. Thanks to Mark over there that drove all the way to, to um, Vegas to fetch the stone. The stone has been sitting with Nassim for a long time. I thought they would do some research with it, but they didn't. I'm now going to take it back to South Africa and we're going to start a series of research programs with the stone because we know that this is the one that actually worked. This is the stone. What I can tell you is that two um, scientists, one in, uh, Slovenia, one in Croatia and one in um, Germany, two scientists that are experts in a new study of sound called hypersound, which very few people are even aware of, 
sound that becomes a very, very powerful tool at high frequencies and high, uh, high levels of uh, speeds. Um, that um, hypersound is a tool that can be used for pretty much everything in, in our society. And that brings us to the next slide, and that's Sazer technology. And I believe that these Taurus stones had everything to do with creating ancient advanced Sazer technology, or the energy fields that were then focused to create Sazer technology through the cone-shaped tools, creating a Sazer beam. So this creates the energy that goes into the, that cone-shaped tool that then creates the Sazer beam and pushes it out of the tip of that tool. I've had lengthy discussions, hours and hours of discussions with some of the smartest physicists and scientists in Germany and in Croatia when I was on tour there, how this technology works. And let me tell you, they are so excited about this. They just want to lay their hands on these cone-shaped tools and these stones. So we're going to have to do some serious research. But guess what? You need money for that. So what I'm going to do starting next year is start a whole internship program to do more research on the ancient ruins and the tools and the artifacts and so forth. And I'm going to do like three months a year of intensive internships where we're going to do loads of exciting research from genetics to botany to soil science to electronics to etc. etc. Archaeology, archaeoastronomy, geology, etc. All the different principles together to show all the people from the different areas how everything is connected and how their respective um, faculties have, have, have boxed them into boxes, not allowing them to think out of the box and realize how their area of research and knowledge is connected to everything else. We're going to cross those boundaries. But this is getting quite heavy. So, a bigger button. Uh, it's, uh, we can, you know, you can come and hold it later. Just... Um, uh, at gunpoint. <laughs> I'm not letting that thing out of my sight ever again. <laughs> so, um, so we're dealing with some ancient knowledge that's giving us a very clear indication of how we can use this ancient technology into the future. Keep in mind, what have we got in our eyes? In our eyes we have rods and cones in our retina, right? What are the cones in our retina uh, connected to the optic nerve is connected to is connected to right in the middle of your brain is your pineal gland correct correct so somehow our pineal gland should be controlling our eyes and our optic nerve and our pineal gland should be picking up all these other frequencies the all seeing eye of Horus connecting us to everything every frequency and giving us ESP ability and much more but we can't do that because those bastards several thousands of years ago screwed up our, our, our um, pineal gland with those cones, cones of theirs. But if you look at our eyes, so in our eyes, in the iris, the irises are actually like toruses. Right? Look at the toruses in our eyes. And the toruses have lenses in them that focus the light, which is also sound, because every light frequency has a sound frequency attached to it. So it, it sends the sound and the light through the lens, through the center of the torus, into the cones in the retina. So now you understand why I get excited about these toruses or the cones combined as tools that we could be used to do things that we can't even imagine yet. We've got this technology encoded in ourselves and this is why when I say that we are advanced technology, people don't get it. We are the most advanced technological tools walking around on this earth. It's encoded in us. Our DNA has all the knowledge of everything in creation that was put there by Enki. And those bastard Anunnakis that turned us into their slaves, but it seemed to be back here kicking butt with all those other entities that are causing trouble for us. But that might be too much information for some people. But what this all leads up to is that we should be able to do anything. We should be able to think anything and manifest it instantly. We should be able to use our eyes like Superman and do stuff like this. We are absolute ultimate creators. We are co-creators of our own reality. And I'm getting totally distracted here, but I get excited about this. And this brings us to the question, what are the stone ruins all about? Are you guys tired? Do you want to... Uh, this is... 
<clears throat> I'm not sure which of these, which of this I'm going to have to cut out, but I'm getting tired myself. But um. <laughs> So what are the stone circles all about? By now you can see that clearly we're dealing with cymatic patterns. Very obvious we're dealing with cymatic patterns. That's what every stone circle is. It's just a representation of the sound frequency that comes out of the earth at that specific point. That's what this is all about. And some of these cymatic, like sand on a metal plate, but now these are stones, right? Some of the, some of the st uh, structures are actually very distinct magnetrons and of those flower shapes. Every time you see a flower shaped stone circle, it means they actually built an ancient giant magnetron like this. Magnetrons that can, that can cut metal in a split second. And I asked two magnetron scientists, how much energy would a magnetron 40 meters in diameter generate? Remember that a tiny magnetron can create so much energy in a laser beam that cuts metal in a split second. I mean, it literally just melts the metal. And, uh, and the answer was that a magnetron that size would create more energy than all the power plants on Earth together combined. One. We have thousands of these magnetrons in Southern Africa. Thousands of them. So. These guys are generating so much energy, it's insane. And we know this because we, we measured it. We measured the sound frequencies, the electromagnetic fields, the loudness in decibels. And it's just insane what's coming out of these stone circles. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with that because it's just, you know, it's getting late. Adam's calendar is the most powerful of all these ancients of these stone circles. Adam's calendar is actually much, much more powerful. It's as if they all seem to be sending their frequencies to Adam's calendar. And that's like the collection point for all this, the energies created by all these millions of stone circles. That's what it seems like. I can't say it is, but that's what it seems like. Because the frequencies there were just ridiculous. Beyond 375 gigahertz coming out of Adam's calendar at, at the site. And electromagnetic fields that run horizontally and then vertically between the two stones in the middle. So what we have at Adam's calendar is a very definite toroidal effect. And it's alive even today because we measured it. And, um, and that reminds us that the stones that ring like bells are what? They're just crystals. They're very, very high in crystalline substance. Very rich in quartz and silica. And remember, silica carries memory. Quartz carries memory. You can store virtually infinite amount of information and knowledge in quartz crystals. And this is why they don't put them in our computers, because that would make the computer industry obsolete. You know, that you buy a computer once and never again. And that's what we're going to do in our Ubuntu communities, build bloody supercomputers. So, because we know how to make them. So when you look at ancient structures built out of stone, you realize that these guys knew exactly what they were doing. They understand that stone is the tool that carries with it, in it, information, storage capacity. It's an energy source. And that's why they used stone. Not because they were stupid, because they were very, very smart. We're the dumb ones, but we're catching up quite quickly. So what's very obvious now is that all these ancient structures from the pyramids, Borobudur, etc. are all ancient machines. They were giant machines built out of stone, crystalline substance, for, to create or to perform specific functions. It's just the function that we haven't figured out. What were they built for? Why were they, what were they supposed to you know, um, do? And this is why they are uh, are aligned with the movement of the sun. Because we're always amazed, yeah, look, this is aligned with the equinoxes and solstices and all this. And we think, oh, because they worship the sun. Oh, no, stupid. This is our stupid way of imagining that the ancients were stupid. They built this machine because the machine was aligned with the sun, because the sun is the, is the activator of these machines. When the sun rises on the equinox over there and the first sun beams come down this passage and hit the standing stone, which is a crystal, you know that because the, all stones have crystal in them. So it's like hitting enter on your computer. Bim! It switches the machine on and the machine does whatever function it's supposed to do until the sun moves over there and then, and then the beam comes through another passage and then hits another, the, the sun, uh, the light and the sound of the sun beams or sunlight hits another stone and it makes, makes the machine either stop whatever it was doing or do perform some other function. And this is why they are aligned with the movement of the sun. So they work whether they're being operated or not. We don't have to sit there and wait and, and keep making it work. It works on its own. It's powered by the sound of the earth. 
and activated by the movement of the sun. I mean, it's bloody brilliant. It's so simple. And now we're figuring this out and we know that the energies are still there because this is a photograph taken of the pyramids and there's still huge energy coming out of the pyramids. Even the symmetrical patterns coming out of Stonehenge, although Stonehenge has been completely reconstructed, there's still very powerful symmetrical patterns coming out of Stonehenge that tells us that its original structure is still was very specifically created as a resonating device, an energy device. And now we get to the very exciting Earth grid that is, seems to connect all these ancient sites on Earth. By now you should know that this is a magnetic grid. It's not just ley lines or some fancy... It's actually very specific energetic patterns that are created by the resonance of the Earth and the magnetic fields that, it's create, that it creates. And it, it, the ancients seem to build all these ancient sites on these nodal points and very powerful points uh, on, the, on these magnetic grids. And this is a, an ancient Sumerian text that actually tells us a lot of very important information. <clears throat> this is a real text that comes from the Shoyan collection. And it says, In the distant days, in those days after destinies had been decreed, after Un and Enlil had set up regulations for heaven and earth. I mean, regulations for heaven and earth. And Enki, the exalted knowing God, um, by the rules for heaven and earth, the fixed rules, he set up cities. It, seems to tell us that there was some sort of a fixed energy grid in the sky, heaven, and the fixed energy grid on the earth. And based on the energy field in the sky and the earth, they, they set up the cities on earth on these specific nodal points. And then David Wilcox several years ago discovered that the, the, the emblems of the Space Command and the Air Force and so forth in the USA refer to the rules. And they have these, these bands around the earth, these, these white bands with these little delta shapes on them. And, these, and they refer to those bands around the, wor the, the world as the rules. And they say there's some sort of energetic field around the world. They don't know where it comes from, but it's always been there. Some sort of energetic field up in the sky that this, this same Sumerian text seems to refer to. They built the cities according to this energetic grid. And here we have the same rules. Read there. It says, the fixed rules, by the rules for heaven and earth, the fixed rules, they set up the cities. And here we have the fixed rules in the sky on the military and air force logos. And my friend Paul Gravenstein in South Africa, who's a remarkable guy, but we don't have time for me to talk about him. Um, he actually measured these rules or these energy grids in the sky. He phoned me out of the blue and he was freaking out. He said, I don't know how to tell you this. I don't know who else to tell, but I, measured, I've made, I picked up this bloody energy grid that's up in the sky. It's just everywhere. It's like a matrix. It's like it consists out of ones and zeros. It's like a binary code, powerful energy field up in the sky. And he said he, he sent up a few, energy, a few energy beams or these devices to try and break it. He says it breaks up momentarily and, and it instantly reforms. You cannot destroy it. He says you can't break it. It's, you can't. it's indestructible. And I just realized <clears throat> that all this ancient stuff that we're dealing with, just like I said, these ancient machines are just advanced technology on a gigantic scale. These obelisks in Egypt, they ring like bells if you listen to them. They very, very, they, they ring like bells, just like those stones in my museum. And, uh, and when you go into these temples in Egypt, you know, we were told that they were built for this and offering. It's all nonsense, offering and praying. And, it's just too many pillars, not enough space. When you look at them from this angle, you realize that this is just something very different. And all those pillars clustered together, why would they build them like that? And then the more I looked at it, the more I realized, now inspired by realizing that the stone circles were powerful energy generating devices, suddenly seeing aerial photographs of these temples in Egypt, I realized that they weren't temples, but they were actually templates. That we're actually looking at gigantic energy circuits circuit boards on a gigantic scale that we could never have imagined. It's just beyond our imagination. The scale that these guys were building things on is something way out of our perception because we just don't have enough money to do that. <laughs> and macro processes, a gigantic macro, micro processes become gigantic macro processes. You know, and, and here 
And we are told that these were, these were places of worship and then this is where the people lived. No, these are giant bloody macro processes and that's part of the circuit board. You know, it's what it is. And you can start seeing that the pyramids were the same thing. Giant power, powerhouses um, creating huge amounts of energy. And just, you know, you start seeing things and recognizing how all this fits into ancient history. Saksai Huaman is also just a giant circuit board. When you look at images um, from the air, you realize it's just a giant circuit board. It's not a, a fortress on top of a mountain to, to ward off marauding crowds and guys and horses and spears. No, it's a giant circuit board. And Borobudur in Indonesia, I mean, look at this. This is just insane. It's like a, just by looking at it, you see it actually resonating in front of your eyes. It's actually move, moves. And look at the top of Borobudur. <laughs> that doesn't tell you that these are energy generating devices shooting stuff into the sky. So all of these ancient temples and structures somehow were built, or many of them, to generate energy and shoot it up, shoot it up into the sky. So it's, it seems like it's these are the devices that seem to keep this energy grid up in the sky. And possibly this is a matrix that keeps us enslaved and dumbed down and, and unaware of what's going on outside of our own planet. What is, it, what is actually out there? What are we looking at when we look up at the sky? As I said, I no longer believe anything that NASA shows me. And it seems that the human sound was actually the, the, the source of the energy that holds up the matrix in the sky. Because you find these, these beautiful um, amphitheaters attached to what used to be these circuit boards. So they get a bunch of people into these amphitheaters, get them excited, they make a lot of noise, and they channel that sound into the, the, the circuit board. It activates the, the machine and it starts to make a noise or whatever and shoots the energy up into the sky upholds the matrix. There's beautiful amphitheater, beautiful resonating pillar of, of a row of pillars that used to feed into the circuit board and so it goes. There's another one. The circuit board was on top of the mountain and the, the source code for it was the amphitheater on the side. Here's another amphitheater right in the middle of a circuit board. This is in Algeria, North Africa and since 2015, oh this is, shows you, I should update this, Nothing has changed in 2017. <laughs> the templates and temples have just become churches. And if you look at the tops of churches and mosques, they just have cones, these cones that face the sky, <laughs> that capture the sound and the energy of the people in the church. Look at those cones facing the sky. It's just spectacular. Capture the sound and the energy of the singing and the clapping and the fear and the anxiety. And especially these ones here. This is the mother of them all. <clears throat> and then business centers and cities. They're just designed to, to channel all the sound and energy up into the sky. Somehow this, just nothing has changed. We seem to continue putting all this energy, the city grids are like giant circuit boards. Generating huge amounts of noise, huge amounts of energy. And strangely enough, all being connected by these channels <laughs> called highways that never stop making a noise, just like the stone circles, we never stop making a noise. And now I understand what Morpheus meant when he said that people are the source of energy. It makes a whole different kind of sense to me now. For, who, for whom and why, I don't quite know, but it seems that we're the energy source that keeps this matrix or this energy field around our planet or up in the sky and that brings me back to the deception that's been woven for us over thousands of years and especially the last few hundred years and this whole thing of gravity and the reality that we find ourselves in. You know, Isaac Newton had, had almost no knowledge of magneticism. He, he actually mentions that he didn't understand it and therefore, therefore he didn't write about it. If he only understood magneticism, he would not have come up with the crap that we now has been shoved down our throats. Gravity doesn't exist. It's all an, it's all an aspect of magneticism. But you can't say this at any institution. We observe it, we can't explain it. It's called gravity. It just you know, holds everything together. 
And it's there to support some very, very important philosophies that have been shoved down our throats about the world that we find ourselves in. In fact, Coulomb describes gravity as an electro electric phenomenon. And it's very eloquently ex explained and very easily explains all the activities around us, especially supporting the whole toroidal structure of our reality. Gravity is much easier explained and explains all aspects of our reality through magneticism and not through this invisible, undefinable thing called gravity. Sound creates magnetic fields, moving magnetic fields create electricity, everything is affected by magneticism, sound and resonance. And therefore gravity is a consequence of sound and magneticism and this is why it should be called the magneto-electric universe and not the electromagnetic universe. Even the processional wobble of, of, our, of our planet, remember we talk about the procession of the equinoxes, this 26,000 year wobble, even that can be explained with magneticism because magnetic fields have their own processional wobble like is explained here. It's spectacular how suddenly everything changes in our reality. And we can start looking at the world we find ourselves in very, very differently. In 1887, there was a very important experiment that was performed. And I'm almost finished here, people. So you can, you can just relax. This is, this is the home run. This just blows my mind. Okay. And in 1887, these two brilliant scientists, and they were pretty much, pretty much pushed out of our knowledge pool, out of our psyche. Mickelson Morley performed what, what became a very important experiment because until then all scientists around throughout the ages were obsessed with the ether. It was known it was called the ether. The ether, the breath of creation, the exist what holds everything together, what holds creation together, what holds the planets in place and so forth. And it was called the ether. And they were obsessed with the ether and they couldn't quite understand what the ether was. They, and they had all kinds of definitions for it. If only they understood that it was vibration and resonance. That's really what they were describing, was the ether, is vibration and resonance. The breath of the Creator that holds everything in perfect harmony and, and coherent, resonant harmony. So, my mickelson morley experiment was performed to prove the existence of the ether. And they wanted to prove that the Earth moves through the ether. Well, they did two very important things. First of all, they couldn't find the ether. They couldn't prove that the ether existed. And they did this with sending out light beams in perpendicular directions, and they were measuring the movement of the light bouncing back, and they found there was no movement. I'm giving it to you a very, very basic English, so it's easy to understand. You can go and research this yourself. And what came back is that there was no movement. There was no deflection, nothing. So. The conclusion was that the Earth is not moving through space. Therefore, the ether does not exist. So I'm not worried about the ether too much because by now we understand that it's resonance and sound. But the most important thing that they showed is that the Earth does not move through space. And as we sit here in this room right now today, there is no scientific evidence whatsoever that has been proven beyond any shadow of doubt, other than the evidence that we've been shown by NASA or the other space agencies. By now we know who they are and who, is, who controls them. There is no scientific evidence that the Earth actually moves through space. I told you I'm going to push you beyond uh, some of our capacity, break down the walls of our own, own resistance. This has really shocked me. And I no longer believe anything. Even Mika Koku says, or what, how you, Michio Kaku, sorry, <laughs> says that there is no scientific evidence presented today that, that tells us unequivocally that the Earth moves through space. What the hell is this all about? What it does tell us that ether has been replaced by the particle physics universe. And we can start seeing the agenda that was put in place a few hundred years ago, starting with the concept of gravity that replaces magneticism. Start, then, then we start seeing the discovery of the electron. In 1897, 
uh, where J.J. Thompson discovers the theoretical particle, the electron. Never proven to exist, but the theoretical particle suddenly becomes a reality. And a few years later, you know, let me remind you, do you see anything physical in the picture of the electron? No. And this is why people like Nikola Tesla and, and um, Edlitz Kalman's comments and even Albert Einstein and many others about the electron and that whole agenda of creating, replacing the ether of, the, of creation with particle physics. Particle physics get very quickly replaces the ether because that's something they didn't want to get us sucked into. And suddenly Rutherford comes with his atomic model in 1909, 1911, and we are still stuck with the same bloody bullshit atomic model that was presented by Rutherford. And that, quite frankly, if you go and look at that experiment, that, that atomic model experiment, I'm sorry, I read it, I've looked at that over and over again. It is so naive, it is so stupid. And if, it can be so quickly and easily explained with magnetic fields. Everything that Rutherford experienced and reported on with his, uh, rather, with his uh, experiment could be very simply explained with magnetic fields and toroidal fields. And then by the time Einstein's, Einstein released his theory of relativity, that was the final death knell in the ether, or the theory of the ether, or as we call resonance and frequency. What's even more interesting and important is that the many um, experiments that have been done, been done with the cosmic background radiation over the years have brought back some very, very interesting results. And uh, Max Tegmark from MIT, uh, in The Principle, I don't know if you've seen the documentary called The Principle, very clearly tells us, and he's the guy that drove that experiment, they found that from our perspective, the Earth is the center of all of creation. <laughs> this, is not, this is not popular in, in mainstream science. And yet this is, this is what the most mainstream science results, the results are telling us. That from our perspective, the Earth is the center of the universe. Not only that, that all, all the other observable uh, galaxies and solar systems seem to exist in layers moving away from Earth as the center of the universe. Do with this information what you want. <laughs> what I'm going to bring you back to is that everything is connected through a fractal nature of resonance that creates magnetic fields and toroidal fractals throughout all of creation. The atomic models, the quantum theory, all of that stuff can be very easily explained with the stuff that I shared with you, with sound resonance and magneticism. What happens is that the more questions we ask about this, the more mysterious are the things we find. And this is why I call this presentation Exploring the Nature of Our Reality and Really Pushing the Boundaries of Our, boundaries of our Own Capacity to Tolerate New Information. Because this certainly has shaken my reality and I no longer believe anything I'm told by any university professor anywhere because they're all lying. And yet, Max Tegmark gave us some very interesting information. What we do with it is what matters most. What do we do with all this knowledge? Because we can't affect what happened in the past, but we certainly can affect tomorrow morning when we wake up and we enter the world and we share our knowledge and information with others. And this is why I believe that we are the ones we've been waiting for and we are creating, we are co-creating a new reality. Now that you know how powerful your thoughts are, how powerful every word you write, how every powerful every message you leave for somebody on your cell phone, how every email you send, how powerful all your communication and all your thoughts are, you realize how quickly we can co-create a new reality for ourselves. Because all of this positive stuff, the positive thinking, the positive talking, the positive co-creation of a new reality for humanity that is filled with prosperity and abundance is right here. We are creating it as we speak it and as we think it. No one can stop that. It's up to us. And the more people say it, think it, speak it, imagine it, the quicker we are going to create it. And <clears throat> we are more enslaved now than we've ever been before. But with this enslavement comes the absolute 
understanding how, of how important it is to liberate, liberate ourselves from this enslavement. And it will require a whole new kind of thinking because we cannot, we cannot solve the problems that were created for us with the same kind of thinking that created the problems. So, our system is broken, it cannot be fixed. We all need a whole new kind of system to get out of this mess. We've been born into the slavery, we now understand it, we've grappled with it, it's okay. The fact that we get it, we understand it, we can now do something about it. And remember that it is the money system that has controlled us, that has enslaved us. Money is the tool by which we are enslaved. Until we come to terms with what money is, where it comes from, how it was created, we will remain subject of those who control and create the supply of money. And if you don't know this yet, the Sumerian king's tablets tell us very clearly that money was created as a tool of enslavement at a very specific point in time in history. It's when these first priest kings were descended from heaven to earth, and these first priest kings created the form of writing. They wrote their clay tablets, and they issued their clay tablets from their temples as the first bankers, as the firm, first forms of money. These are the first forms of money we find on earth. Whether it's 6,000 or 8,000 years ago, who knows. But what it tells us is that the first kings owned all the land. They were the first bankers and their temples were their first banks. And the way they created money is exactly the same way that our bankers create money today.